day. Good morning, everybody. Hope you are having a great morning. So, um, breaking news this morning, Moderna, which is a pharmaceutical company we all know, and has been working on a vaccine for coronavirus. And they've had a head start, I think, because some of their drugs have been tested for similar things. Well, they announced that their phase one trial that they did on 45 people with three different doses was a success in all the 45 people. They all got antibodies. The moment you hear that, the markets are shooting up. Pre-market, the Dow is up 750 points. And everyone's all excited because, of course, we all recognize and know that our country and our world will not get back to any sense of normalcy until we have a vaccine. We could open up the economy and we could, you know, Governor Baker is going to announce today that the place of worship could open under certain conditions and eventually we're all going to get back to work. But the world won't have normalcy until we have a vaccine. So everyone's fighting who's going to get the vaccine first. And if I've been reading, I read an article on Bloomberg News how... Is this competition, which country is going to get the vaccine first? Because whichever country gets it first will, of course, have the critical mass of the first vaccines available for their country. And then eventually, of course, the world will get it. And last week, I think France and this company in France that's uh, working on a vaccine announced that America will get it first because they're the ones that are investing in it. And there's a whole discussion who invests in this. And this tremendous competition between America and China of who's going to get the vaccine. A lot of tribalism going on. So I wanted to talk about something in the portion and then connect it to this and, and, and discuss what are, you know, the advantages and disadvantages of, of, of this type of uh, thing going on. So they say the story about this uh, Boba Finkelstein. She immigrates from uh, Europe, the Yiddish Imam, and she comes to America and she's in New York. And she gets on the train, she has to go to Washington. Well, on the way to Washington, she has one stop. Her stop is in Philadelphia. She gets up in Philadelphia. This Yiddish imam doesn't really speak any English. She can't see which way to go. And she gets on the wrong train. Instead of going to Washington, she goes to back on the train to New York. She's on the train back to New York. And she sits down, she sees a friend of hers that she met. And she says, oh, where are you going? And the woman says, I'm going to New York. So Mrs. Finkelstein gets back for seat, and she, as she's sitting down, she remarks herself, this is America, what an amazing place. You can have one train going both directions, to New York and to Washington at the same time. Why do I say this? Listen carefully. In this week's Torah portion, I told you we speak about numbers. But the book is also called Bamidbo, which means the desert. And it speaks about the Jews travel the desert for 40 years. We all remember that God took the Jews out of Egypt and was going to take them to Mount Sinai to get the Torah. But on the way, the Jews sinned, and they ended up wandering in the desert for 40 years. 40 years they traveled. But it was a system the way they traveled. They built a tabernacle, a place where God could rest his Shekhinah, his, his divinity, his feminine divinity. And then they all traveled around the Mishka. But the Torah tells us something very Interesting in Bamidbar, right after the Torah tells us to count the Jews, it says, Ish al digloy leves avaisav. That every single tribe had to travel with its flag to the house of its fathers. Tells us, Tengamach de Ephraim, in a lot of commentaries, we know that each of the tribes had a flag. Levi's flag was black, and on it it had the breastplate of the Hoshan, and, and Shimon's flag was, was, a, was a picture of Shechem, which it captured, and the Reuven's flag. Everyone had a different color and a beautiful flag. Binyamin's flag had a tapestry of all the flags together, and so on and so forth. So each of the Jewish, of the, of the tribes in Israel, the 12 tribes, had a flag. Their flag stayed with their tribe, and the rabbis tell us that it was forbidden for you to dwell with a flag from another tribe, and you have to stay with your tribe. Now we all know what's going on here. The Torah speaks so much about unity, so much about Am Yisrael, the nation of Israel. Yet here we see the Torah tells us about tribalism. Everyone has a flag and a unique color, and we all have to celebrate that color and that that, that flag and identify with our with our with our community. Why not? Just speak about the general unity. What's the idea what the Torah tells us about each of the flags representing their own tribe? 
So I was thinking about this, but you know, back in the, in the, in the early 1900s, one of the greatest ideas in America was what was called the melting pot. What was the melting pot? It was an inherent belief that in order for America to, America to succeed, and all the immigrants who were flocking to America to blend in, they had to be part of a melting pot. What's a melting pot? All the immigrants would put in their cultures and their styles, and it would all melt into liquid where it had no form, and they would totally integrate into American society, and they would become just like all Americans, forget about their heritage, and so on. And we all know that unfortunately, many, many Jews, when they came to Ellis Island, they threw their tefillin overboard, they cut their payas and their beers, and they threw their yarmulkes and their talises and their Shabbos candles. They were becoming part of the melting pot. It was the most popular thing. Who introduced this idea of the melting pot? It was a Jewish immigrant named Israel Zangvil. Israel Zangvil was a son of Polish immigrants who was British born, and he believed in assimilation, emancipation, he strongly believed in the idea that we have to leave our cultures, leave what we had, and become part of the general greater community. Well, guess what? Zangvo made a play, and the play was called The Melting Pot. The play started, it, it premiered in, I think, New York in 1908, 1909, and the hero of the play was a man named David. Now, David immigrated in this play when his parents were murdered in 1903 in the Kishinev riots. His whole family was destroyed, and he comes to America, and he writes this, this, this idea called the Crucible, which again speaks about integration and assimilation. And he meets this lovely girl, her name is, um, I forget her name, Vera. She's a Christian Russian, Russian Christian Vera, and he falls in love with her. And the climax of the play is when he gets to meet Vera's father. And he finds out that Vera's father was the soldier responsible for the murder of his entire family. And he meets Vera's father, this Russian soldier, Christian Russian soldier. And he, Vera's father apologizes, he forgives him, and they get married, and they live happily ever after. At least that's what the play shows you. When it premiered in New York, President Roosevelt was sitting in the box front seats, leaned over to Zangville and said, Zangville, what an amazing play. This is brilliant. What was the idea? Melting pot. Forget about your cultures. No tribes and no identity. We're all, no more minorities, no more ethnic minorities. We're all part of one big idea, one big dream. But of course we all know that Roosevelt was wrong because Zangville's idea led to millions of Jews shedding their Judaism, shedding thousands of years of tradition, their cultures, their connection to God, their relationship to spirituality, to holiness, to their people. And today we don't even know if they're Jewish anymore. But the truth is that the melting pot wasn't just bad for Jews, it was bad for America. Because suddenly we realize that when you lose your identity and you lose your culture and you lose your personality and you lose your customs, when there's nothing that, that gives us distinction of who we are, then there can't be true growth. There can't be true success. And therefore, it took till the 1960s. But in the 1960s, America came up with a new idea, which was multiculturalism. No! We're a beautiful tapestry of different cultures and different ideas and different people that make one beautiful country. Now let me ask you something. You see, the Torah tells the Jews in the Midbar, each one had a flag. But you know what the Torah says right after? It tells us that each one had its unique flag. They should all dwell around the tabernacle. And the rabbis tell us that for 40 years when the Jews traveled, there was exact spaces where each tribe traveled and sat and, and, and dwelled right circling around. Four tribes on the left, on the right, in the front, and in the back of the tabernacle, all facing the tra tabernacle. You see, what do we say in chapter 20 in Psalms? One of the most famous Psalms we say, which we ask for God, we say, Vanachnu. We go with God's flag. Tribalism is a problem. 
when there's nothing that unites us, when there's no common goal, when there's no common identity, when there's nothing that, that brings us together that's greater than us, a goal of someone that unites us all. When you have that, then you can't have, then you, when you don't have that, then, try, then each tribe won't work. But when a, God tells the Jewish people that you all need identity, you all need individuality, you all need to be able to be unique, to be different. But at the same point, Isha Digloi, Saviv La Mishkan Yachanu. You got to encircle and all have one common goal to build together a dwelling place for Hashem to have something that's spiritual, that's greater than all of us. You see, for the humanity of man, for the for, for the unity of man, of humanity, for the unity of humanity, we need one God. But for the God's unity to be complete, we need human diversity. For our unity, we need one God. But for God's unity, He needs human diversity. People being different. People bringing something to the table that's different than someone else, contributing in their own way. But there's one thing, Isha Digloy, we can all have our own flag, but we need to also have one common goal. And that's why even today when America has multiculturalism, it sounds good, that's all great. Only if we have one common goal, spirituality, holiness, God, something greater than us, a cause that's greater than just mine and yours. So you think about, Moderna, and you think about the vaccine. You know, I remember when back in April, when the, the right at the beginning, when our, our country closed down and it was really bad. And I remember our, our dear friend and neighbor Bob Kraft, when I see so often running around here, you know, every day walking, comes by the house, and he went and sent his plane of the Patriots to get right a million plus masks. Today we already forgot it. So much has happened since then. But I, I wasn't so impressed. It was the top of the news. I said, look, listen, for him, it's the best advertisement. Of course, he'll do it. You know how much publicity he got? But you know what touched me the most? That he took 300,000 of those masks and he sent it to New York. New York, talk about rivals. Talk about the Patriots. Who's going to ever forget the Giants, that perfect season? And who's going to ever forget the other season? We lost two seasons. They took away our Super Bowl from us. Yet when it came... We all have our individuality. We're the Patriots, they're the Giants, they're New York, we're Boston. But when it came to a crisis, we recognized that yes, we each have our flag, but some of la la mishkan yachanu, there's something that unites us. So of course, my Maimonides tells us that every human being has a responsibility first for their family, then for their own community, when we give charity even. The Torah tells us how to give charity. First you look after your own family, then you look after your own community. Charity starts at home. You can't give charity. If you're not going to give charity to your own family, who are you going to give charity to, right? There's the oldest adage and story about this guy who comes to ask a wealthy man for charity for a poor person. And he says, listen, he says, you know, I have a daughter who's unemployed for two years. And he says, I also have an uncle who's been sick for years and's in a wheelchair. And I have a sister who doesn't even have a home. She's homeless. And the guy says, I'm sorry. And he says, if I don't support them, you think I'm going to help you? But the truth is that we all understand that first you help your family, your own community, and then you continue outwards. So we understand that if someone gets a vaccine, if someone's successful in, in, in if Moderna or, or, or Johnson & Johnson, whoever it may be, has a vaccine, they can, of course, America will use it first for its own people. But at the same point, we have to also remember that as much as we're worried only about our own, we can't only worry about our own. Because ultimately, we're all under one God. And that's the message of today, that we all have to have individuality in our own flag, but we have to dwell around the tabernacle and around God. Have a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow.